Well, we are returning this morning, obviously, to our studies in this theme of spiritual warfare as we work our way through this large paragraph in Ephesians chapter 6. And so if you would turn back there, if you haven't already, to Ephesians chapter 6, I would just like us to reread the one and a half verses that will be our focus this morning. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, and into the first part of verse 14. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand or having girded your waist with truth. Well, as soldiers of the Lord Jesus, we are those, remember, who have been conscripted into his army. And as his soldiers, we need discernment. We need skill if we would be fighting in a successful way in the army of our Lord. As we've considered in recent weeks, we, we've, we've, if you like, looked at something of our enemy. We've looked at his audaciousness at times, his boldness. And yet we've also identified that at other times, any enemy, according to our own experience, is very sneaky. He, he is rather slippery or, or subtle. He, he is something like a snake. And sometimes he dresses himself up as an angel of light, according to Paul's teaching in his second letter to the church. He is at work, at large in our world, deceiving the nations, as we saw last week from Revelation 12. And yet we also know that he comes to church and he's working deception, even in the context of God's people. All the time, the great red dragon, remember, is enraged against the church, especially since Calvary, when he was defeated by Christ. And he knows that his time is short. In our previous studies, we we have primarily focusing on our enemy. We've looked at something of his tactics, something of his defeat. But from today, we want to move forward in the paragraph here in Ephesians chapter 6 and look more closely at the Christian soldier. And so today, we're we're considering what I've simply entitled, Armed to Stand. And the two primary things we're going to look at is firstly, the soldier's armor, and then secondly, begin to look at the soldier's armor. Okay, So firstly, the soldier's posture. And again, it comes to us so very clearly in verses 13 and 14, where he says, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand. Stand, therefore. And so here's the basic question. From those verses, what is the soldier in Christ's army, what is to be his or her posture? It's obvious. Our look through Paul that the Christian soldier must stand. Our captain, the captain of our army, commands us here that we should stand individually as individual soldiers. But it's broader than that because he actually directs us corporately to stand. I remind you that every paragraph is in the plural. And when he says here in verse 14, stand therefore, he puts that in the plural. So we should think beyond just ourselves as an individual soldier trying to survive in our Christian life. Paul is directing God's people. And so we should think shoulder to shoulder. Conduct, if you like, of of every soldier in the regiment standing together. So there's that, that idea of the Roman military unit. They're all in line. And their shields actually would lock together in a wall of defense. Shoulder to shoulder. It's a unit that is moving forward on attack. And so we sang before, onward Christian soldiers marching on towards that war. And so there's that sense of togetherness as we move forward. It's not just one soldier by him or herself, but it's the whole unit. And the whole unit is given this same directive from the captain, the posture to stand. I think just briefly, there are two things that are implied by this. And the first thing is, this clearly means no surrender. 
You see, to be told to stand is the opposite to think of to flee or to surrender. When a captain in an army sees his men retreating or maybe they are on the verge of surrender, he gives out the order, stand. Christian soldiers are are to steadfastly resist, never yield to Satan and his attacks. In other words, we are not to retreat. We are to stand. We are to be resisting our enemy. And what does God promise if we do? Well, James 4 verse 7 tells us, if we, our captain, if we submit to God and if we resist the devil, guess who's the one who does the fleeing? The devil will flee from you, he promises. And when Peter says in 1 Peter 5, remember the text, watch out for the devil, he's like a lion, he's roaming whom he may devour, he then says, the very next verse, resist him. Steadfast in your faith, he says. Or not actually your faith, it's actually more correctly, steadfast in the faith. Don't budge one inch. You hold in, our captain says. And yet standing can be dangerous. We know that. Paul's whole analogy here in Ephesians 6 is is of a Christian being in a fight. He's a soldier and he's in a battle. So it's not the fairy tale scene of Christians walking together so pleasantly of daffodils. This is warfare. We are engaged in hand-to-hand battle. Remember, as we saw in our previous study back from verse 12, it is a wrestle. That's a one-to-one, hand-on-hand, face-in-face, smelling the breath of your enemy. You are there in his face. And there, that's the posture that we must be standing. It means no surrender. Now, of course, for literally scores and scores of Christians today in our world who are obeying this command and they are standing up, they are standing up for Jesus and they are not surrendering and that is meaning this very day they are laying down their lives, they are losing their lives in this world for him. They're in the battle. We saw that last week in Revelation 12 verse 11 where it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, not loving us to the death. As we'll see as we come into the, the coming studies and the, as, the various aspects of or the pieces of the armour, God provides armour to protect the Christian while for fighting, not to protect the Christian treating. In military campaigns, Some captains purposely cut off all avenues of retreat so their soldiers would fight to the death. As soon as William the Conqueror, his army, set foot on English soil, he sent away that dropped them there. In their sight, they saw them sailing away. Why? In his mind, retreat was not an option. Surrender must not even enter into the minds of his troops. Some commentators point out that the armour of God that is mentioned here, God provides, described here in this passage, gives protection for the front of the soldier and not protection for his back. Because our posture is to stand and to fight the enemy, not to turn around and run from the enemy. We stand, we resist, we're steadfast. And the promise is, he will retreat, he will flee, he will run even from us. So the posture to stand in the first place implies no surrender. In the second place it implies no slumber. That the posture of standing is awaking or it's a, a watching position. Okay, so here we're talking about soldiers. We're not talking about horses who have some crazy ability to sleep while they're standing up. We're talking about soldiers who are in a battle. And so the call to stand is a call to be... A... In the military, the old expression they used to use, stand to your arms. That, that, that means stay alert. And watch. In some cases it was death, remember, to the soldier. To the Roman soldier. If he was found asleep on duty, remember what happened in Acts 12? 
comes and releases Peter from the, from the prison. There's Roman soldiers in that prison. You read the passage, what does Herod do to those Roman soldiers? He kills them because they had fallen asleep on duty. They had been slumbering and they should have been standing to their arms. They should have been alert and watching at their post. So here's the whole concept that the Christian soldier must be constantly alert, not nodding off, not allowing the the, the enemy to sneak on in. Because the weakest temptation can overcome the strongest when they are not alert. You think about it. While strong Samson slept, Delilah come in, cut off his long locks. When Saul slept, He lost his spear. When David was idle and he should have been out with his army, when he arose uh, that evening and he went up on his roof and he saw Bathsheba and in his spiritual slumber, what did he do? He opened the door to the enemy to win a tragic victory in his life. David was not spiritually alert. So our spiritual slumber can actually inadvertently by us or just ajar perhaps a little for the enemy to come in. Now if you go back to chapter 4, it's, it's back to the other time, earlier time in the passage where, where the Satan, where our enemy, where the devil is spoken about, he gives a, an exhortation which we've previously studied, but let's just look at this as an example. In Ephesians 26 he says, Be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, and then immediately he says, Nor give place to the devil, nor give an opportunity for the devil. You think of the soldier. He's assigned to guard and he's on the outskirts of the city and there on that that perimeter, if you like, he must keep watch there as keenly as as he as if he was the, the king's personal bodyguard right there in the palace, right there in the heart of the city, because if the enemy break through on the outside, on the limits, they will gain access to the inner city. And so if we fall asleep, if we yield to a temptation along the perimeters of our hearts, we give the devil a a foothold from which he could create havoc in our lives. So in in, the example that he gives, you may become angry and, and thoughtlessly flows out bitter words in that heat. At that very moment, such unholy language spills from your mouth the devil is right there he finds a door open and he enters in and then of course can come gushing forth words that you would never otherwise ever dream to say as a Christian it's imperative that we stay alert at all times lest in our spiritual slumber we open the door to the devil and it doesn't matter who we are it doesn't matter how long we've been a soldier does it it's a constant command. It's, it's in the present tense. We must keep doing this. Well, maybe you have been a Christian for some time now and God has, God has helped you resist the devil on many times in the past. Just like that soldier who's on duty. He's been at that same post for, 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 for many, many times before and, and, and yes, there's been some problems but he's never really had real big problems recently. Maybe it's once or twice, a, a year ago or so or something and, but nothing recently and, and in that setting of, of, of him, he, he's tempted to slumber, he's tempted to, to nod off, he's tempted to slacken off on his duty. <laughs> Josephus, the, the historian, tells a story and I'm not saying that this is all historically fact, it's... it's Maybe, but I, I'm not saying that it is. But nevertheless, it's interesting. Josephus tells us about the sons of Noah and how they lived for years after the flood, but they only lived on the tops of high mountains. They did not dare to come down off the top. They didn't want to build their, their houses in lower ground for fear of being drowned by another deluge. But as time went on, no flood came. And their concerns subsided and, and guess what? They ventured down to the plains, down to the plains of Shina. That helps you to understand that's got to do with the Tower of Babel. And there as they ventured down, the, the, the form of fear gave way to foolishness and eventually they are caught up in the arrogant attempts to build a high tower against God. 
the very men were alert to potential dangers, they slackened off and they fell into a gross sin. And again, we could illustrate, illustrate it with David, couldn't we? And that just that horrific sin that he fell into, it happened at a time when he spiritually nodded off. The soldier is to stand. That, that is to be the constant posture, ever alert, ever watchful. Peter says, be sober, be uh, vigilant. Why? Because you've got an enemy. He's like a roaring lion who wants to devour you. You resist him. You be steadfast in the faith. Term the faith is a technical term in the New Testament that means more than just your personal faith in Jesus. It talks about the apostolic truth. It talks about the gospel. It talks about God's revealed truth. Be steadfast in the faith. So the soldier's posture, no surrender, no slumber, we end. But how? How? Well, this is the wonder of our God because he not only commands us, but he provides for us the means by which we can obey him. He gives us everything we need so that in his strength, as his soldiers, we can stand. And so let's come now and begin our study in the soldier's armour. But just go back to verse 11 and notice the connection in verse 11. Put on the whole armour of God that you may. It's a purpose clause. So that. Do this so that will ha- this will happen. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the various methods and schemes of God. The devil. So here Paul shows us that there is a close connection between the armour of God and a soldier's capacity to stand. We haven't been conscripted into Christ's army and then left to fend for ourselves. Come up with your own ideas of how to do tactics against Satan, how to survive against Satan until you get to heaven. No, God hasn't left us on our own. He has supplied the army, armor, and it's actually called, is it not here, the armor of God. It's called that in verse 11. It's called that in verse 13. It's the armor of God. It's his sufficient and bountiful for us. And so we just stop here, friends. We see the grace of God here. We see the goodness of God here. We see the provision of God here. Last week I heard of a man who won a two-week cruise. He didn't have much money, so he came up with the plan of how he was going to eat for those two weeks. And so he decided to buy enough bread and enough peanut butter to make his sandwiches to last for that two-week period. And off he goes on his cruise. About a week into the cruise, someone had been noticing him and someone comes to him and says, why are you peanut butter sandwiches when all the banquets are available for you on your cruise? You see the point? As Christians, we can fail to realize all the wonderful supplies God has provided for us as his people and way below how God would have us live. And that includes not making the use of all the armour of God that he supplies. And so by not putting on the whole armour of God that he actually supplies, what do we do? We not only sell ourselves short, but worse than that, we leave our vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one in this real war that we are each in as Christians. Now we know... When Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, we know where he was. Look at verse 20. For which I am an ambassador in chains. Back in chapter 4 and previous study a long time ago, we saw that he called himself a prisoner of the Lord. He is, this is sometimes called one of the prison epistles because he wrote it from prison. He's in chains according to verse 20. And it's very likely that he was actually literally chained to a Roman soldier as he writes or as he dictates the writing of this letter. And so that's not hard to imagine where Paul's whole imagery comes from. 
And as he then goes in to describe the armour that the Romans wore, he lists six primary items. The soldier's armour that he mentions here, what are those six things? Belt, breastplate, shoes, shield, helmet, and sword. Six things. We're not going to look at them all this morning. We're just going to take the time to look at the first one, the belt. Because like anything, the more you study it, the more you realize there was more there than you thought in the first place. And there is enough here for us just on the belt. I wonder this morning who here has a belt on. I, I would imagine that probably most of the men, most of the guys have a belt on. But why? Why, why did you put your belt on? Well, you say, well, because my wife gave it to me and she expects me to wear it. You know, she likes this. It's, it's fashionable. Well, probably most of us would not answer that way. Probably most would say, well, it is actually a helpful thing. It, it has a practical purpose. I don't wear braces. I wear, I, I wear a belt to hold my pants up. Houses up. Okay, it serves a purpose. And maybe, ladies, maybe you've got a belt or some sort of sash on, but... But most often, perhaps, your belt's more, for, more of an appearance thing, more of a, a fashion thing. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Why did they wear a belt? Why did the, the Roman soldiers wear a belt? Well, it seems that the Roman soldiers' belt served a couple of purposes. First, it would actually help hold the breastplate in its place. And so if the breastplate fell perhaps to the side or, or if it lifted up, what would it do? It would expose your lower vital organs to the enemy's attack. You see, the, the soldier's belt was, was there, if you like, supplied as a, as a level of even protection. It was made of leather. It would help protect the, the soldier's body in the vulnerable region of the moon. Now, maybe, and I did notice before when I was down the back there singing, looked down and saw one of the children's Bibles and they had a picture of a Roman soldier printed in their Bible and maybe you've got or maybe you've seen pictures of that and you look at it and you think, well, where's the belt? You think, well, there's a little tiny thing. Maybe that's the belt. I'm not sure that that's a very accurate description. The Roman soldier's belt actually was in terms of its size. The soldier would wear a belt for another reason. Um, and that would be to tuck up the long tunic, the long gar garment, or maybe the cape. Maybe sometimes you've seen that. They used to like, not Superman's cape, they had a red cape. They had some sort of cape that would come down and, and use the belt to tuck up their long flowing garment into their belt. Peter uses something of the same language. Gird up the loins of your mind. Tuck up the long flowing garments. Get them out of the way so that you may be free from entanglement in the combat. You see the point? So the soldier was ready to fight. He would always have on his belt. Now let's look more closely at what it says there in verse 14. Where it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Okay, so it's a belt. But Paul's point is, the Christian soldier must put on the belt. Truth. Where is truth found? Well, surely truth is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you look back at Ephesians chapter 4 again, back in verse 20, we're thinking here of the similar thing. Ephesians 4.20, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed, you're not like the Gentiles, but you are different, you, you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Truth is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. You can't think of truth if you're going to think biblically without thinking of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth is conveyed by the Spirit. He is called the Spirit of truth. Truth, the Spirit inscripturated in God's Word. And so you can't think of truth without thinking of the Spirit of truth and you can't think of truth without thinking of the Spirit-inspired truth. Bible. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. 
your word, Father, is truth. God is a God of the word. His word comes to us in words. Words that come to us here in a context that always have a clear meaning. It's a book of truth, what we have here in the Bible. Actually, it testifies to that itself. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. The gospel itself is truth. Look back at Ephesians 1, 13. Letting the Bible interpret the Bible, we see in Ephesians 1, 13, In him you also trusted... After you heard the word of truth, what's that? The gospel of our salvation. How are you born again? Well, James tells you in James 1.13, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. He, in his own sovereignty, doing that work of spiritual birth or rebirth and he does it by the gospel or the word of truth. Now those of you who are here this morning who are not saved, I'd say to you this is relevant right here. Perhaps you're a young person. Your your problem, I I would say, in in the case of almost everyone here, your problem is not that you don't know the truth in terms of having an been taught to you, you've had that blessing, you, you have received the truth by instruction. It's not that you haven't been given a f- the Bible isn't believed, or it's not that you're like some of your friends who are not in a Bible believing church. Your problem is that you, you yourself, you don't actually believe the truth. You don't. You have an embrace truth of the gospel for yourself. You don't live the truth. You need to submit to him who is the truth. You need to love the truth of the gospel to the saving of your soul. And by God's grace, you can. Now, Paul here in Ephesians 6 is, is, is addressing Christ. And he says to Christians, he says to these, this church in Ephesus in the first place, he says, put on the whole armour of God. Number one, that means, the first thing that means is you must, number one, put on the belt of truth. You must wrap truth, if you like, around you. You must know truth, but more than submit to truth, you must believe the truth, you must embrace the truth, you must live out the truth. Truth, remember, as it is embodied in Jesus, truth as it is conveyed by the Spirit in His Word, the truth of the Gospel. Have it, he's saying, encompass your entire life, wrap it around, tighten up the belt to the last notch. Fix it firmly on you. We should know whom we have believed. We should know what we believe. Truth brings certainty. Truth brings strength and stability. Without the belt of truth, a soldier is weak. Without the belt of truth, a soldier is vulnerable. Without the belt, the breastplate is not going to be in its right place. Everything is held together by truth. Truth in its interrelatedness. You see, truth holds everything in its right place. Truth is essential. Remember what the belt was also used? It it was used to tuck up the the robe, the the long flowing cape. It was used to tuck it up. It was freeing up the soldier from entanglement in in the combat so that he's ready for action, so that he's able to move forward on attack without being restricted. That's relevant. If we... We will be the most free to run with the gospel. And make the most progress in the gospel. And so all your thoughts are to tie down to the word of God, not laying loose. 
Fasten down, Paul saying, all your convictions that you've done. And you've got verse. Not just some vague ideas, this is what I always thought, this is what they taught me in Sunday school, but not just a personal opinion. But you can say, here it is, brother. Here it is, sister. It is in the word. It's in this context. Words have meanings. We need to know the truth. So we may be able to move forward, if you like, on attack without restrictions. Truth frees the Christian soldier from the entanglement that comes with the confusion of everything. It slows you down. You're not able to make as quick progress as otherwise you would. You can move forward. Scriptural truth, biblical doctrine is not an optional extra for some keen Christians. It is absolutely essential for the Christian in the fight against the red dragon until the day we leave the battlefield and enter heaven. It's as we go through the gate of the celestial city, that's when, if you like, we take off the belt of truth. Now, don't be popular today, and it certainly is not. But according to Paul, it is essential. A soldier's belt supplied a level of protection and surely truth protects us from being wounded by Satan's many lies. To enter into spiritual conflict, ignorant. To enter into spiritual conflict, doubting. Is like a soldier entering into a battle blind. Or a soldier entering into a battle lame. He might go get on for just a little while, yet sooner rather than later he's going to be taken down. You see the point, an ignorant doubting Christian of what he or she believes in Christ's army is going to be taken down sooner rather than later. Truth is vital in spiritual And so when Satan attacks, when he assaults and the bullets are flying and the bombs are exploding, we need to be able to say, this I know because God has said it. It doesn't matter how I feel. This is truth. This reality. And when Satan comes with his bullets and his darts of lies, we can say to Satan, that's not true. That's a lie. This is what God has said. And this is exactly what he means. Don't you try and twist it. I believe it. I'll stick to it. And by God's grace, I will live by it. We must not only know the truth, I'm not just talking about head stuff here. If that's what you're thinking, you've misunderstood me. It's not what Paul's thinking about alone. It's got to start there. Truth must be personally embraced. Personally, what's the language? Put on the belt of truth. Personal belief in the truth. It is to be fastened to me, not loosely hanging about me. But but the buckle is to be done up to its tightest hole. Truth is to be attached to me and I am to be attached to the truth. And so Satan may drop, make one of his bombs, maybe just a smoke bomb. But girded with truth, we can know what's true, we can see through the smoke and we will not be deceived. Now I don't know about you, but does it not seem a little odd that the first thing that Paul draws our attention to in the soldier's armour is the belt? Does that seem a bit odd to you? Probably not the first thing we would see if someone turned up this morning and they were all done out in the original, authentic Roman armour. We see that man, he's ready for war, and we look at him, probably one of the first things we'd see is the big sh- Or the sword, right boys? I don't think it'd be just the boys. That's probably the first thing we would look at. You're the soldier though. 
So, what would you say if someone said to you, if you are going to survive, soldier, what you need first is to put on your belt? Is that where you begin? With a belt? Listen to dear Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said this, Truth is the first thing we put on. Without it, we are completely lost. It means that we have a settled conviction with regards to the truth. It means that there are no uncertainties, no doubts. It means that there must be no lack of clarity in our Christian living. There is no hope, says, unless we put this on first. And he's right, isn't he? There is no salvation without truth. But it doesn't stop there. There can be no progress in the Christian life without truth. That's why it's so important. Remember Jesus? Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The means that God gives for saving and saving is the word of truth. Truth is absolutely essential first now we are living at a time when the priority of truth is rejected truth in our day is seen as well it's relative or it's seen as irrelevant our culture is one that seems to be using Pilate's words you Jesus people talk about truth (laughs) what is truth skepticism doubts, uncertainties, questioning everything. That's our day. And they come and say, well, what might be true for you may not be true for me. You see, the spirit of the age wants everyone uncertain. And you are frowned upon as a Christian if you believe anything firmly. You're hated even if you hold to strong biblical convictions. Friends, let's step back and let's see behind all the skepticism, behind all the doubt, behind all the confusion about truth today is our enemy. He spreads the lie that doctrine in a church is... He spreads spreads the lie that doctrine divides. He spreads the lie that doctrine only makes little Pharisees. In many ways, the problem wasn't what in the large measure the Pharisees believed it wasn't their head the problem was their heart we need to tighten up the belt and yet what is the message of our day it's like well you need to loosen up I mean you need to lighten up you you need to you need to just you know scratch a little where people are itching last things that Paul told Timothy when he was pastoring this very church. Turn with me please in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. It's a relevant text because it's to a man who's ministering in this very church. It's one of the last things that Paul says that's going to have an impact on this same church in Ephesus. What does he say in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3? And I want you to have a think of who the they is in the verse. Verse 3. For the time will come when they... He's in that church. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away... What from? The t- and be turned aside to fables. And what's he say to, the, to, to, to Timothy in verse 2? The whole point of why he's saying what he did in verse 3 and 4 is his exhortation in verse 2 that he is to preach the word. Surely that's a description in verse 3 and 4 of our day as well. Heaped up teachers... People turning their ears away 
from the truth in the context of religion. People given nothing more than stories. Isn't that our day? The Christian's belt has been slowly unbuckled. Satan is trying to disarm arm the Christian church at its first point. And so this whole concept that the truth of God is objective, that's mocked today. We live in a culture where sentiment reigns. Truth doesn't matter. What matter is how I feel. What matters is my subjective feeling. Truth is seen as Irrelevant, or at least, okay, it's, it's got a place, but it's, it's subordinate. It's under experience. Because experience today is paramount. And so therefore, in our culture, because experience is the thing, I need entertainment. I need my amusements to feed my craving for experience. Such thinking has invaded the church. Let's remember Satan's nature. Let's remember his tactics. The devil hates truth. He hates Christ who is the truth. He hates the gospel of truth. He hates the spirit of truth. He violently hates the Bible which is truth. And he'll do everything he can to get Christians away from the objective truth. Jesus says, there is no truth in the devil. He is a liar and he has been a liar from the beginning. He is the father of lies. He's a master of error. He's a master of confusion. And then so there's so many voices today that are are, are, are seeking to turn the Christians or the church, if you like, at large, away from the truth, Scripture alone. And so what's, as this is put aside as the authority, as the only authority, as the sufficient God for everything in life, unto godliness to glorify God, both to be saved and to get to heaven. When sola scripture is put aside, what happens? Well, we have Christians chasing after visions and dreams and prophecies and tongues. And all the while, the official Christian soldier is not being taught biblical truth so that they can believe, so that they can embrace, so that they can live out the truth. Friends, it's a subtle message. It's a lie. But the subtle message of all of that is, is that this book is not enough. I mean, it's good... It's good, but it's not perfect revelation because it's not complete. We need something more. We need more revelation today. So many people can't actually see what's happening. We're living at a time when the belt of truth is being loosened. Is it any wonder that is seen making inroads in the rise of false teachers and the falling of standards of righteousness in Christians' lives? Here, I suggest to you is why so many Christians get pushed around in their spiritual lives by the devil. They go running here, they go running there, crying on one shoulder to the next. They are not grounded in the truth and therefore they're not standing. Here's why the devil gains the upper hand in their lives mentally, emotionally even. They struggle with the spirit of defeat when there's no real deep-seated conviction. And when trials come, they crumble. They don't stand. Because truth does not govern their thinking. Truth does not govern their emotions because they have not been girding their lives with truth. What does Paul do? He places authority for the Christian soldier on truth. I draw your attention to the clear connection he makes 
What does he say there in verse 14? Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. In other words, no truth, you won't stand. No girding yourself, no encompassing yourself with biblical truth, with truth as it is in Jesus, with truth found in the word of God, and you'll fall. The positive direction is encompass your entire life with the truth and you will be able to stand even in this evil day. And yet the emphasis in modern Christianity, it seems, has become more often than not subjective experience, not objective biblical truth. Any, go to church to get the lift up through what they call worship which often is little more than an emotional experience because largely in our day worship has degenerated into how I feel and what I gain it's all about me and what I actually like rather the biblical sense of worship is about God it's all about him and what he wants And there's that sense, that true sense of awe. Bowing in reverence and humility, yes, but also sitting joyfully before his holy word. So individual Christians, the Christian church corporately today, I say to you, the basis of what Paul is saying will not be able to stand unless there is the active putting on of the belt of truth. What is that truth? It's truth embodied in Jesus. It's the truth of the gospel. It's truth in this blessed book, the Bible. We are in a fight. It's spiritual warfare. And the first thing that we are told to put on is the belt of truth. And that's why we want to encourage you to read your Bible daily. To study your Bible yourself. You're a soldier as a Christian. You need the belt of truth on. You must put on the belt of truth. You need to know the truth, submit to the truth, believe the truth, embrace the truth, live out. And to help encourage this, when we come together, we are committed to reading consecutively through the book of truth. You know, I had a look at this this last week, it's been 12 years, just over 12 years, began to read consecutively through portions of the Bible in our services. Just a portion each week. In that period of time, friends, we have covered five books in the Old Testament, two other books in, in, in large matter in the Old Testament, and every book in the New Testament bar four. We're committed to truth. We want to help you and encourage you to to gird yourself with the truth. But not just reading the Bible at home, not just reading the Bible in the family, not just reading the Bible in the Bible yourself and with your friends, not just reading the Bible here, even when we come together, we want to sing objective truth. And so we choose scripture-saturated hymns. We love good tunes. Right tunes are great. Words are more important. Words sung that are rich in Bible truth. Whoever comes to stand in this pulpit comes after hours of labouring in the word of truth. Truth that has been carefully studied in its context. Truth conveyed through God's scripture which always have meanings so that the preacher can stand and say, Before God, as much light as he's given me today, this is what I believe the Lord clearly says. And friends, here it is in our Bibles. See it? We want to help you to be good soldiers of Christ.
so that together we can stand shoulder to shoulder, so that together we can put on the belt of truth. So that on Monday, Monday is coming, <laughs> on Monday when Satan comes bombarding you with all of his lies, or when the world sprays you with all of its bullets of their confusing and competing ideas of the philosophies of the age, and that happens on Tuesday, you can discern. You can detect. Because you've been studying the truth. And hence you can stand against the devil's lies. You remember when Jesus, in the wilderness, you remember Jesus, when he responded to the devil, what did he respond with? Responded with the truth. Satan attacks with lies. Jesus stands in the wilderness. He puts on the belt of truth. And what happens to Satan? He flees. If Satan was so bold to attack our captain with lies, we can be sure that he will attack lower ranking soldiers. So let us not only follow the orders of our captain, let's follow his example. He leads from the front. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. You must put on the belt of truth if you will be able to stand in the evil day. May God help us all. That we may be good soldiers of our captain. Let's pray.